Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. Join us in the political trenches, local government at work, as we examine the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with my co-host Ian McCormick, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated, will provide insights and perspectives on challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Now, today we bring you the letter J, which stands for jurisdictions. Later in the episode, we will be speaking with Reeve Paul McLaughlin, president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. But first, we follow up on a recent federal budget where the federal government finalized the downloading of the retroactive pay for RCMP members to municipalities. Then we will discuss the province of Alberta BC hiring municipal advisors to assist local governments. And lastly, we will be heading to Atlantic Canada to talk about inflation causing headaches for municipalities when it comes to potholes. But first, Ian, how are you? I'm okay. My voice is a little weird today, Chris, but other than that, I feel okay. Good to see I'm, you. I'm looking forward to this discussion, yeah. uh, our, our conversation later on to uh, uh, this episode. But first, I want to talk about the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. They have responded earlier last week to the federal government's decision to pass on what they are calling the unbudgeted and unaccounted for RCMP costs to municipalities. Putting this into perspective, according to our uh, uh, FCM, the city of Moncton in New Brunswick is getting a $5.7 million bill for retroactive pay to municipalities. The town of Hinton in Alberta, 750,000. The town of Portage La Prairie in Manitoba, 800,000. The city of Vernon, BC, 3.4 million. Ian, how are smaller municipalities who rely on the services of the RCMP going to handle this large bill? It's a good question, Kristen. I think in different ways, in different places, and some just won't. The uh... The interesting thing for me, uh, well, one of the interesting things is the vast majority of municipalities in this country are served by the RCMP and have historically been so. They have been left holding the bag here by the federal government as this retroactive pay has come in due to uh, contract negotiations. I know that uh, municipal associations and probably individual municipalities have been pushing the federal government through their MPs and advocacy groups like FCM to cover this gap between what was anticipated and what reality was. And this probably came as a pretty big surprise. And given the outspoken nature of the response from FCM, for example, and other associations and individuals, it's something which isn't going down very well uh, across the country. Uh, some municipalities that I've spoken to and worked with have actually put a bit of money aside in the anticipation that um, they might have to pay this bill and hoping that they could reprofile that money because the federal government picked up the cost. Uh, so those ones are probably okay in that, that they had budgeted for it. There are lots of small municipalities, rural and urban, which are kind of running pretty close to the edge uh, financially anyway. And when you talk in this uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, up to millions of dollars, it's gonna be very difficult to absorb. And the other thing to this then is because local governments have such limited ability to raise money and so such limited tools, ultimately, this is going to fall to the uh, property tax in some in a lot of places, property tax increases, which are uh, of I mean, they are money that is going to be requested of local taxpayers. Those so same local taxpayers would have been footing this bill, even if the federal government had picked it up. So what this has done, and apropos of our jurisdictional comment today, or topic today, is this is a, essentially a downloading of responsibility without the downloading of commensurate resources to go with it. So politically, it doesn't have an impact on the federal government, but it likely will have an impact on some local governments, which are going to have to raise their property tax rates to cover this downloaded cost. So it's something that I think is really significant and a, a real lack of jurisdictional clarity and accountability on the part of the federal government. Now, the municipalities have two years to pay this bill, and I, I, I usually don't throw to a video clip, but I want to throw to a video clip right now. Um, earlier last week, uh, Alberta municipalities met in Edmonton where FCM president, uh, former FCM president, now on leave, FCM president Tanine Rudick and uh, Alberta municipalities president Kathy Heron basically came out and said, don't pay this bill yet. You have two years to pay it. And I want to just play this so that way I'm not making it up. But here's the clip that I'm talking about. 
And I just spoke with Tanine, and she is encouraging all of us to express um, concern with the download, of course, in your media and to your MP. And she's saying, let's wait a little bit longer before we start paying these bills. We do have two years. That's until March 31st of 25 to pay these invoices. FCM has issued a statement expressing their disappointment with the decision. And they also convened a meeting of all the provincial and territorial association presidents and staff just this morning to work on our, um, our advocacy. We'll let you know as soon as, if anything changes, as a result of the meeting and our association will have a, a press release out probably sometime this week. If you're a municipality under 5,000 and receive policing services from the RCMP through the Provincial Police Service Agreement, your cost will remain the same as established under the police funding model brought in in 2020. However, this model expires next year and we're not sure what the new model will look like. When we have organizations who represent municipalities, whether they be small or large across this country saying, don't pay your bills because we're going to try and do some lobbying of the government. Does this put push the, uh, the issue down the road even further? Because in that same speech, Kathy Heron said that the federal government is now back at the table for their second round of collective bargaining for the RCMP for the last year's uh, increase. So they're going to be potentially seeing another increase on top of the, this bill that they just got. How do yeah, I guess conceivably it currently this? certainly could do that. Uh, advocacy organizations here, whether it's FCM or whether it's provincial and territorial advocacy associations are doing what they're supposed to do in that they're advocating for their members. And uh they're uh, they're saying essentially that let us do our job here and we'll see what we can do between now and the time this thing actually comes due. Your point is true, though, however, that the bill gets bigger as we keep on going. So there's a I'm not sure if it's a game of chicken, but we know what the costs are going to be over the next few years. And it's a do we pay it now? Do we pay it later? Or do does the federal government say, you know what, this properly or part of this, at least, is properly uh, in our in our bailiwicks bailiwick. So. It is something that um, I think the FCM, and in this case, uh, Alberta municipalities have taken on, that says, let us do what we need to do. Uh, obviously, the advocacy efforts to date haven't worked for whatever reason, but perhaps there are some new arguments to be made. Or now that there is the reality of this, maybe there is the opportunity for some of these provincial and territorial and federal advocacy groups to, to build up an ally group of other organizations or entities which can see something similar on the horizon for themselves as well. So I, I think it's probably a prudent thing for them to have said. Two small towns in BC are having such big problems that the BC provincial government is hiring two outside municipal advisors to help provide guidance and advice. Local governments deserve to have a safe working environment, said the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Anne Kang, in a CBC article, describing why the province put forth the jobs posting earlier this month for two new positions. Two villages in the outskirts of the Lower Mainland have seen the election of two new mayors and the subsequent departures of most senior staffs with public feuding between the mayors and established councillors. Ian. Now, you were recently in B.C. touring and speaking with municipal politicians. Are municipalities across the province facing transitional issues since the last municipal election? It's quite possible that could be true, I suppose. They, there are six months or so since the election. Some people got reelected. A lot of new people got elected for the very first time, which means there are lots of new, new councillors, new mayors. Uh, some of these smaller municipalities will have inherited bylaws and policies and probably not looked at them for a while. So they may have the rules and just not be following the rules and being called out for that in some places where people are behaving badly. There have been calls for codes of conduct, codes of ethics as well. You mentioned this, but these two particular roles, which are, I think it's quite wise if you can get a a, a respected, senior, seasoned, experienced person to help out these places. But ultimately, the the uh, the buck stops with the local government. These advisors can make recommendations to the minister or to the local government. The local governments should be the ones to empower themselves to make changes. But I think in some cases, this has certainly proven to be a problem. If they don't, then the minister could intervene or the courts could intervene too if it's a matter that's under their jurisdiction. 
And so uh, the idea of having a code of conduct, I think, is a good one. However, trying to develop such a thing at a time of internal strife is not going to work. It is something that other provinces have done and made mandatory. And it's much like there's an adage that says, don't discuss snow clearing policy in winter and don't just consider grass cutting policy in summer. In the same way as this is don't talk about council codes of conduct when you're in the midst of something like this. So this could be a bit of a, a way to go for the provincial government in BC. It's perhaps not a bad idea at the very least. And there are places like Ontario, for example, where people such as integrity commissioners are mandatory. Uh, those people are often legal people rather than local government people. Hopefully they've got some experience in local government. But some of it then tends to look a little bit paternal as well. That the We talk about separation of orders of government as we talk about jurisdiction. In this case, the, 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 parent, the parental nature of the provincial government in BC looking out for the best interests of local government could be an argument to be made that we know best, father knows best in this case. Maybe that's not always the case, but in this case, uh, it, with these two particular municipalities, and there are others in BC as well, to be fair, that they do need something done here and now, and this is it for the now, for the time being. So I just want to stick on this question because I find these the, these two municipalities quite unique. Well, I, I, I don't have the names of the uh, the towns in front of me right now, but I know the stories. One is relates to a council meeting where a fellow councillor stole literally a gavel from the person who right. was chairing the meet meeting. And the, if you watch the video, you can see the, the council meeting descend into chaos, gavel banging. And then the second one is from uh, the personality clashes of a council versus a mayor where the uh, councillor called the mayor Hitler. And I'm not paraphrasing that's what he literally no, called him. Right. personalities come into play in this whether ethics code of conduct is great personalities as well comes into play here how do you see municipalities trying to work through personality conflicts outside of the ethical conflicts and the code of conduct uh, uh, conflicts because when it comes to personalities you have a lot of type a personalities around these council tables and they all want to be heard yeah, it's both a quandary and a quagmire. And I would have pointed out the same thing you did about Taipei personalities, that these people, people run for local office, at least if it's a competitive election, people will run on a mandate for change, however they perceive it. And somebody who might be getting the way of my idea for how to make change happen is perhaps somebody who I'm going to have a problem with. These people are also uh, brought to around the same table by the voters rather than uh, choosing their own teams. And as such, they are expected to work together, even if they don't necessarily like each other. And I'm an advocate of things like uh, a style analysis, to understand each other as human beings, uh, and in as much as you are legislators as well. So some of that might be just going out for dinner. Some of it might be doing something like a Colors or a Hats or a Myers-Briggs or something to that effect. So to try and anticipate these problems, because they're going to come uh, and get them out of the way early, the other piece is things like a covenant amongst members of council so that when you and I are disagreeing, we're not disagreeing over uh, personality, we're disagreeing over something that's in our covenant. And then the, the stronger legislation, of course, would be a bylaw, things like a code of conduct or a code of ethics too. So those are all ways to kind of deal with this. I don't think we're ever going to get rid of conflict in local government or any order of government. And I think that generally that's okay. As long as the arguments are about philosophy and and points of uh, legislative differences rather than personality impacts or personality conflicts. And in some of these smaller communities where people have lived a long time, there's often a long history uh, that goes back to meeting by the bike racks after school when we were in grade eight. So sometimes those Hatfield and McCoy things lie under the surface, too, that we don't see necessarily popping up uh, in immediately visible but certainly do have an impact on how well government or governance is carried out. Ian, it seems as though drivers in Fredericton can blame inflation, at least in part, every time they encounter a pothole. The soaring cost of good and services brought on by inflation means that the city of Fredericton needs to spend more and more money replacing its aging infrastructure, including roads, water, pipes, and buses. Ian, how do municipalities face rising costs with the betterment of their communities? 
Like we've talked earlier and several times too about the limited number of, uh, of levers that the local government has in order to raise money. The biggest one in most cases anyway is property tax. And so to, to look after those potholes, obviously they ultimately it's the person who lives in the community or the business that operates there that ends up footing the bill. Something else that's a little bit different when we talk about things like inflation is the bucket of goods that a municipality buys is quite different from the bucket of goods that you and I would buy to run a household. They buy way more asphalt and gravel than I do and way less milk and clothing than I do. So the, there are differences in municipal uh, inflation rates as there are in uh, consumer inflation rates too. This, In this case, asset management has come to bear. Uh, we know that climate is hard on assets over time and just time tends to degrade some of those deeper assets that we have and they need to be repaired. And if they're not looked after in a prudent way, then the cost cost of, re, of uh, replacing them it becomes astronomical and very difficult for a municipality to absorb. So things like asset management plans, reserves become important. I do recognize too that in tight times, reserves are something that not all municipalities can do. And that, and that might be the case a little bit with, with Fredericton. One of the things with potholes is that they are kind of literally front and center, that if the roads are in disrepair, people notice immediately. So that becomes an election issue, even though it's not really a governance issue. It becomes, uh, from a government's perspective, it looks like economic development or it looks like uh, efficient transportation networks. But you're not going to see that on our campaign brochure. You're going to see, I will fill potholes. So in, in this case, it's something that is quite significant. Um, and it can also be a matter of jurisdiction here as well. Uh, provincial and territorial highways versus in the run through my municipality, for example. So if I'm add because the highway is in lousy shape and I blame my municipal council member, it may not in fact have anything to do with that municipal council member, but they still take heat for that. So there are some, some things that happen here. It takes money for local governments to run. It always does, always has, always will. And there still is, as we have said several times, that single taxpayer who pays for whatever, the, whatever this might be, but it's an ounce of prevention or a pound of cure. And sometimes we just don't have the money for that ounce of prevention. And that becomes quite difficult. And it pushes, yeah. the, pushes the problem down the road to the next council. So I don't have to take the blame. Oh, I guess I should do my wrap up. So I'm going to cut there for a second. I was okay. going to pass. Um, Ian, uh, that's right. We will be right back after this quick message from Bucking the Trend. Uh, uh, how do we tackle abuse in the political realm? Uh, and we'll be back with Reeve Paul McLaughlin talking about jurisdictions and how he sees them. So stay tuned. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case by case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Welcome to Jays for Jurisdiction. Today on the show, we are honored to have Reeve Paul McLaughlin. Reeve McLaughlin is currently serving his fifth term on Pinoca County Council and is the president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. He has been on the front line over the last few years as the role of municipal governments have been expanding and changing. We are looking forward to hearing from Reeve McLaughlin about his views on how the provincial and federal jurisdictions have changed the role and realm that is municipal governments. Reeve McLaughlin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Paul, I want to start with this overarching question. In your five terms on Pinoca County Council, have you seen the encroachment of provincial and federal jurisdictions into the downloading realm that is municipal government? And I, always, I always tell this story. So before I was elected, uh, when I was elected, I was 37. And, and, and back in that day in 2007, I was probably one of the youngest people at the AAMDC conference back in the day. 
But the gentleman that I replaced his position, they actually locally referred to him as the road manager. And really the job of rural municipal politician was roads. We talked about roads, we talked about bridges, roads, roads, roads. Fast forward to today, uh, Pinocchio County is talking about healthcare, talking about policing, talking about broadband, talking about economic development. And not that those aren't bad things to have in our wheelhouse, but you know, really within 20 years, uh, the role as a rural municipal leader has changed so significantly um, that, that I would say that this job has transformed and we are dealing with all issues related to, uh, to be a voice for all rural Albertans. I really like that term jurisdictional bleed. I haven't heard that one before, but I can certainly understand what it, what it means. We, I mean, even the way the constitution is set up or our federalism is set up, that there are some uh, pieces of work, if you like, or areas of jurisdiction, which seem to overlap. Things like energy, for example, where you and the feds and the province all have a parts of it, or uh, in showing up in things like abandoned oil wells, for example. Uh, you made an oblique reference to things like policing and how the real rural governments have moved away from roads, bridges, and culverts. And so with that, what happens when there is a lack of jurisdictional clarity? How does RMA handle it, or how does it, how do you as Panoka County handle that? Well, and I think it, it's been important to realize that when those gaps exist, the advocacy that has to occur, and if you look at our resolutions, um, very few of our resolutions now, less than 10% are related to infrastructure. And, and they're really tied to that, that social framework, the FCSSs, the, 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 dealing with the policing, ambulance, healthcare. And, and I think what's happening is, is, truth be told, the leadership at the municipal level um, is trying to fill that gap where you've got that, that piece where it's not being addressed, mm -hmm. resources aren't being allocated properly. And we are using anecdotal references on what's broken and using that as a, as a core voice. And, and I think that it's interesting because the Sovereignty Act's a great example. So our response to the Sovereignty Act is, okay, excellent. Uh, you know, do what you got to do. <laughs> but at the same time, we need to recognize some authorities, um, species at risk. So if I read a county said, oh yeah, Sovereignty Act, um, province of Alberta says I can take out the, the lesser wandering warbler habitat because you guys don't think it matters. Um, after I spend 10 years in jail and have a million dollar fine as the Reba County, I'm seeing that as a bit of an issue. So respecting those jurisdictions and that, those authorities, I think, is an important part of our role. Um, and then trying to backfill those holes that exist where, where things aren't being addressed, things aren't being done properly, and, and we need to continue that voice. So is it that jurisdiction, jurisdictional creep? or specifically where you're being either asked to do things you hadn't historically been asked to do, or as you have said, you're picking up the ball when others won't. Is it that, or is it the fact that you're getting these things, the responsibility, if you like, without some commensurate authority or commensurate resources to do that as well? Well, it, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, municipalities only have access to 10 cents on the dollar for every, for tax. And so we're having to do the best we can. But that being said, our tax efficiency is incredible. Um, you look at municipal leaders in, in general, uh, we are the most tight-fisted, we get things done, uh, quite literally in some cases with binder twine and, and duct tape, but all within engineering specs, just to be clear. I'm not saying right. that we have unsafe infrastructure. But, but yeah, and that's, I think, probably what we regret the most is that I'm paying for policing. I just got a million dollar bill for policing. Um, I'm having to, I don't know what my future bill for policing is going to be because right. of all the discussions, body cams, who's paying for that. Um, you can see what's happened with the, with the negotiation of the contract and you, and, and one of the converse, conversations is around that retroactive pay. Someone was negotiating a contract. Um, President Tanine Rudick's probably got one of the best analogies is that, that, uh, we've been invited for dinner. Someone's chose what we're going to eat. Um, and then we get stuck with the bill. And we get treated like that from the federal and provincial government on a regular basis, um, that they're using us as a third funding source, and it's regrettable. But that is literally, in many cases, uh, they're using municipal taxation as a backfill for deficiencies and, and inefficiencies in, in other, uh, other, other programs. So it, it's one of those things that when's the other shoe going to drop? I don't know. 
I want to go up to Lesser Slave River here for a second because Lesser Slave River was dealing with a bridge infrastructure issue. The province had downloaded that bridge onto a municipality and the municipality said, well, we can't fix it. We just can't. How much of advocacy and lobbying the government does your job now entitle compared to when you were first elected back in 2007? Because the role of rural municipalities has drastically changed even through the pandemic, but I would say probably about five years before the pandemic, where it became more of a lobbying aspect and less of a day-to-day -day operations of passing policies at your county, at your council table. Oh, I mean, there's the, the, the growth of the, uh, the lobbying industry is quite significant that are working with municipalities. If that tells you something that, <laughs> that either they're not effectively working through their MLAs, which back in the day, you'd tell your MLA, this bridge is a mess. Can you advocate for me? And likely that isn't resonating. And I think that, you know, the bridge in, in Lesser Slave, I think, is, is a fascinating conversation. I mean, you look at the history of that bridge and, and, and you know, that's World War II. That's the old uh, uh, that's the old Alaska Highway infrastructure. And people are driving on what would be an actually a historical heart artifact that happens to feed, uh, significantly feed the GDP of Alberta. You're going to hear from our from our northern members that the their contribution to GDP is significant, but the flow back is quite minimal. Um, the fact is that those good folks are really keeping our, our economy afloat uh, and providing that cash flow, but they're not seeing uh, resources flow the other direction. And, and Lesser Slave is a perfect example. That is a critical infrastructure um, that just isn't being addressed. And the local MLA, uh, I don't know, I think he, he might have been in Mexico when, the, when they started talking about complaining about the bridge, but uh, quite literally, I think he was in Mexico. But the... Uh, <laughs> Wasn't trying to throw Pat Wren under the bus here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You know what? And here's the, here's my other comment because we're coming into election. You, you got to think of what the best job in the world is as an MLA. You get to you get to go to 50th wedding anniversaries. You get to you have staff that answer your calls for you that can can tell you're working on it. You get to go to the big house and be in the fancy dome and solve things. It's it's literally if you do the job, you will be elected forever. Like you literally, if you listen to your people and you advocate for them and you're a voice for them. And when you don't do that, guess what? You turtle and you hide. And that's what's happening I'm seeing on the ground. And you're not seeing action from, we need to empower these MLAs to have an open voice and to advocate for their members. Because um, guess what's happening? Truth be told, what's happening then is municipalities are having to be the voice that the MLA used to be. And they're having to hire lobbyists or starting to lobby for projects like this, which to me, it's a foregone conclusion that that critical infrastructure, that bridge and lesser, um, that is a provincial responsibility because they're getting the royalties on the back end of it. And why does lesser slave have to advocate for themselves? It's because um, those elected officials at the that the federal or the provincial level just aren't doing their job. You, you, some of the things you've talked about are are kind of how we got to where we are right now. So we know what the past is. And we kind of have an idea what the present is. Do you see any trends happening? What do you think is going to happen over the next 5, 10, 20 years in terms of this uh, this jurisdictional clarity, is it going to get any more clear, less clear? And, you know, I, and I think some positive pieces, and I think that, you know, I, I'm i obviously uh, biased, uh, I'm not even cognitive bias, I'm full of bias that I believe in local government. Um, you know, historically, uh, education, to a certain extent, was under, under local government, and health was too. And, and this sort of bigger is better centralization conversation is really a disconnect between a better way to deliver services. And I actually believe in local decision making and and and, and I do believe in local use of resources. Um, my relationship with my local RCMP detachment is strong. We're getting the work done. We're providing the resources. Um, every time you level up, it becomes less dis less connected. And I think that we can probably, you know, going back to the past of, of empowering local government. I think is a solution. What comes with that, though, is the resource conversation. Right. You know, how do your resource um, in order for you to effectively deliver those services? But I would say if you've got if you've got some, and I think that really if you've got some of those local leaders together to solve problems, I think you'll have some really really deep thinkers now, uh, really strong people that really just want to make their communities better. And I think that's a that's something we should leverage. Um, that's something that I think we should take advantage of. Um, and I think that the fact that they're so connected and so responsive to their communities, you almost can't lose if you're, you're involving that local voice. Um, you'll probably make way better solutions than you will 
if you're stuck in downtown Ottawa or in the big house in, in uh, Edmonton. There is a report that was published earlier this year from a uh, university of Guelph where examined rural Ontario municipalities and the title of it was doing more with less. Uh, we've talked about jurisdiction a lot over the last uh, half hour, but I want to know from you, are municipalities asking to do more with less? And if so, how do you, as I'm going to say rural uh, councils, deal with issues when it comes to RCMP, health care, whether it comes to unpaid oil and gas property taxes, and the downloading of provincial and federal jurisdictions onto municipalities. How are you surviving by doing more with less money? <laughs> that's that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, which literally, it's a multi million dollar question. It uh, you know so look at look at the trajectory. So I'll, I'll I could speak of Pinocchio County's finances because I know them extremely well. So seventy percent of our tax revenues from oil and gas. Um, we have older legacy fields that are depleting. Uh, my municipality has written off $5.5 million of unpaid oil and gas taxes. We still have probably another less than a million that's at risk. Um, but I also have a changing landscape. I have the situation where I've got these legacy fields. I've got this depleting resource so that the demand for that resource is changing, not that it won't still be there. Um, so I've got that situation. Then I have the downloading conversation. And I can see by my trajectory that that... I am going to have an issue um, five to seven years from now. And I'm going to have an issue with decrease, lowering tax rates. Um, I'm going to have a situation with infrastructure demands. I'm going to have a situation where downloading. Um, and I'm going to have a financial problem. Uh, right now, the, the provincial government has entrenched in the last budget a billion dollars less than what we should be entitled to uh, under MSI, which became LGFF. A billion dollars. So they've shortchanged municipalities a billion dollars uh and, and so that is going to catch up with us and we are going to have an infrastructure deficit in this province five to seven years from now from a decision that's made today so what we're going to continue to do is say where's our money we we should be entitled to a billion dollars plain and simple uh and the fact is is that part of our tax room uh at, on property tax is absorbed by education so three billion dollars comes out of your taxes as all albertans property owners uh goes to the provincial government as school tax that's tax room that's not available to us and that was the whole the whole idea behind msi so in my county i'm mid-level so i'm a mid-sized county anybody on either end of me is going to have the same story in some cases worse um, anybody that actually is a smaller municipality with a smaller population or more remote is going to be actually on a faster turn for, for financial issues. And I'm seeing that already. Um, and so it's going to be diversification, economic development. It's going to be looking for ways to replace the oil and gas industry as our future tax source, as well as having increasing demands from population increases in rural Alberta and a more demanding uh, need for the folks that are moving to rural Alberta. Uh, the folks that are moving here, they're the engineers, the, the nurses, the folks that came from the city of Calgary uh, or city of Edmonton, uh, they demand a lot more services than what Pinocchio County provides. And we have to dance that dance, which is quite a complex dance, uh, because there's an independent group of folks out here that take care of their own thing. Um, and we've had people move to our county going, so what days do you clear my driveway of snow? And the answer is never. Um we, you clear your own driveway and people are shocked. They're like, what? You guys don't clear our driveways? No, everything past your end of your road is yours. So no, we, we don't clear driveways. Um, Reeve, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. This has been an honor to sit down and chat with you about the jurisdictional changes that we've seen over the last few years and how it's impacting communities like Pinocchio County, but also rural councils. So thank you so much. Thanks for, Thanks for having me. So with that, uh, we will be back uh, after this quick message. And next week, next Wednesday, our full interview with Reeve Paul McLaughlin will be airing. So check that out. Till then. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case by case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances.
On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Well, Ian, another great episode, and I am so uh, happy that we got to sit down with Paul McLaughlin Reeve of Pinoca County Council, but also president of RMA to talk about jurisdictions. Our first three stories, we talked a lot about jurisdictions. How did you feel about today's episode? I always enjoy conversations with Reeve McLaughlin. He's he's one of those fellows who is thoughtful, but candid. And so it's useful to be able to hear what uh, what he thinks and as such, what his mem- what he does on behalf of his member. So that was really good. It is a bit of a troubling time for local government, of course, as new councils try and find their way, as we're seeing the impact of the federal government and some of this lack of jurisd- jurisdictional clarity too. So this is something that I think was a very timely episode. We are in April, and April means that we have a symposium in Edmonton coming up here later on this month, bucking the trend, tackling abuse in the local political realm. Um, are you excited? Well, less than about 20 days, if depending on when people listen to this episode. Yeah. yeah, that's true, actually, Chris. We are excited. We're kind of in last minute, not last minute, but uh, dotting I's, crossing T's, making sure everybody's confirmed to come and space is there and meals are prepped and agendas are set and all that sort of thing. So a lot of those last minute details are things that we're actively working on at the moment. We are hearing more and more comments about how necessary the topic of discussion is. We're also hearing comments about, well, what do we do afterwards, right? What comes up after we've had the conversation about uh, tackling abuse? What do we do next? And so that's something that's on our plate at the moment as well. So we're really looking forward to it. So for those who want to buy tickets, because tickets are still available, they can pick them up at buckingthetrend.ca. The links are in the show notes. And if you're looking at this on YouTube, the graphics are right there or right below me. Um, Check them out. I highly recommend it. I will be there giving a a presentation about intersectionality and abuse. Uh, Ian's going to be there giving a presentation. Uh, Our past guest, Ben, who uh, I sat down with and we talked about the symposium in length, which will be linked in the show notes as well. That episode uh, will be be there giving a, a presentation as well so i'm really looking forward to uh, networking with people but also learning how to tackle abuse in the political realm so ian um until next time uh, i guess so hey? I, I just want to say if you have an idea for a show or if you want to come on the show and talk about a certain topic send us a message i really love to have people come and message us. We do get the ra- random message from time to time, but we want to hear directly from you. So if you have a story you want us to talk about, send it to us. The emails are in the show notes or f- messages on social media. So until then, Ian, always a pleasure. Indeed. Thanks, Chris. Nice to see you.